really excited to share um, out of the book of Nehemiah on this leadership challenge. Welcome everyone online, whether you're joining us in Tampa, Orlando, South Florida, and Greenhouse, soon to be in Jacksonville. Come on, man. we we'll just got to see that there. More info to come on that. Um, I want to say if you're newer to Christianity or you've um, been burnt by um, I'd say the um, evangelical church. You know, I was um, in Tampa last week at our church there, and um, I was walking, at, we'd ate um, lunch at this place downtown Tampa, and um, I was walking to the car. There's a guy coming from the gym, Crunch Fitness is right there, and I'm walking and just introduced myself, started talking to him. I said, hey, you know, do you have any faith background? He's like, he's like oh, no, I, I want nothing to do with institutional religion. It's burnt me so bad. And I was like, me too. And he's like, Really? And I was like, yes, I, I hate the way, and I just started naming the, the hypocrisy. And he's like, me too. And the way they spend money, me too. And we just started going through our things. He's like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm a pastor at a church. <laughs> and, uh, but he's like, I said, man, I love Jesus. And he's like, see, I, he goes, I love Jesus, but I really, I really don't like, I said, oh, no, no, we don't like the same thing, but we do love Jesus. And he's like, okay, what? Well, what like church you go to? I'll be open to checking that out. So whether you're from a different religion or you're just checking Greenhouse out, you are a follower of Jesus or you've been disenfranchised, welcome. And if you're a hypocrite, join Hypocrites Anonymous. We're all <laughs> kind of in this together trying to follow Jesus with our inconsistencies and all of the stuff we bring to the table. So you're a part of a really unique, special family. Um, today I'm talking leadership, all right? And I, I'm so excited about the passage. Pastor Mike allows me to share in this. Can I just say this? The mission and the burden that Nehemiah had produced a lot of leadership principles we're gonna talk about. But the mission of your burden um, hinges on your ability to assemble, mobilize, and cover people. Look at your neighbor and say, people. I think, I'd say leadership is easier when it is stagnant. It is much harder when it is dynamic, and people are dynamic. We are Enneagrams one, three, seven, nine, four, two. We're Enneagrams, we're DISC, we're um, ENFPs, we're INSTJs. We are super dynamic and crazy people. Someone say amen to that, right? And so there's, there's like a uniqueness, and leadership requires a capacity to lead, to mobilize and assemble people if we're gonna change this world. My son's a part of an AAU basketball team. He's 13 years old. He um, thinks he's better than me. He's still not. He thinks he can beat me up. He cannot. He thinks he can out-wrestle me. He cannot. He thinks he can jump higher than me. He can now. But, um, <laughs> and, um, but he's a part of an AAU basketball team. Is anybody a part of any, have ever been a part of any travel teams, like softball, cheerleading, basketball, volleyball, anybody right here? All right, or you have family members. Um, Really crazy culture in and of itself, right? If you're a part of that. So, but Matthew's a part of a team and I, every tournament they go to, when they first show up, um, they just, they don't look the part. Like when you see the team walk in, you see them like kind of run on the court, you see them like warming up and everyone from the stands is like, oh, this is, and then we've won four out of six tournaments we've played in. And by the end of the last term we were in, we were in Tallahassee, and the Gainesville team beat all the Tallahassee teams. Come on, somebody. We know who God's hand is on. And so, uh, um, <laughs> um, and I remember by, when we first came in, everyone's laughing at us. By the end, the, by the last game, all the teams are watching, filming, and posting stuff. And, it's, and I'm watching this coach at, who's a strategist. He's taking the players he has and not the players he had from another team and he's maximizing all of their strengths, putting them in place where it minimizes where they're weak. And he is, it's just beautiful basketball. It's beautiful basketball. And when I see great leadership and I see people taking the people that are under their care and their watch and they're maximizing their gifts, they're maximizing their talents and they're making them perform at the, the, the highest possible level they can, I get so deeply excited. It's the reason I admire Jesus Christ. The, he is not just the savior of the world. He didn't just die for your sins. He's the best leader that ever lived. 
the best leader to ever live. He took 12 people and changed the world for thousands of years. I mean, the guy mobilized a team. You looked at their unique dynamic and all of their inconsistencies, all their junk, all their fear, all their jealousy, all of their big mouths, and he changed the world with them. Listen to me. If you're gonna be, if you're gonna achieve the burden that you have clarity on from last week's message, if you're gonna accomplish this mission and vision, we have to become great leaders of people. When you read books like Good to Great Business Books, phenomenal business book, he says, get the right people on your bus and get them in the right seats. People leadership matters. One book by John Carter called Leading Change. And he's like, if you're going to lead change, there's seven key steps. The first one is create a sense of urgency. In other words, with the people in your care, you have to do something about this. And the next step is building a guiding coalition of people to achieve and move the change. He, John, John Carter says in his book, he's like, listen, we are... Um, we exalt and we worship all these amazing monarchs or CEOs that are like kind of the leading up there and visionaries, and you should. But Martin Luther King was a great leader because he mobilized people around him. Does everybody know that? So I think there's like, a, and even the book Scaling Up, right, which is a book on taking your business from like where it is now and kind of not, you know, falling on that curve and scaling up. He says there's four key things you have to focus on as a business leader, entrepreneur, which is strategy, execution, cash flow, and he says the fourth one is people. Today we're gonna to talk about Nehemiah's ability as a leader to lead and to mobilize and to assemble people, all right? So Nehemiah chapter two, if you wanna look in your Bible, you can. If not, um, you can see it on the screen. We're gonna read verses nine through 20, all right? And now listen, as we're reading this, the verses will be up here, as we're reading this, look at all the people. So let me catch up on the story, just for you guys that are newer, and um, I'm familiar with Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a cupbearer in the king's court, all right? This is where he's at. Cupbearer every day, bringing him nice wine, clean cup, being faithful in that. And one day, someone comes from Jerusalem, right? So the king's court's in Persia. Someone comes from Jerusalem. He's an exiled Jew, comes from Jerusalem and says, and he asks, he's like, hey, how's Jerusalem? Now, Nehemiah, given, has never actually been to the homeland. So he's like, hey, how's Jerusalem? And they're like, its walls are down. All of our people are so vulnerable. They could be attacked from any side. It's a mess. So Nehemiah chapter one, he's gripped with a burden. He weeps, he fasts, he prays for four months. Creates a plan, gets clarity on that plan. Then he's sad in the presence of the king. And the king's like, why are you sad in my presence? And we know from Esther, the series on Esther, you don't, you don't show up in a king's court sad. Are you gonna get, right? So he's sad, the king says, why are you sad in my presence? He's like, how can I be happy here in your court when the walls are down in my homeland? He's like, well, what do you want? Nehemiah's like, I'm glad you asked because I've been preparing and planning and got clarity. I need these wood, I need this timber, I need this. And he's like, all right, here's all this stuff. Here's letters, everything you need, now go. Verse nine, chapter two, we're picking up, he's starting to go, all right? He's in motion to Jerusalem and he's gonna get to Jerusalem and deal with the people in the walls. You guys with me? Everybody tracking? Amen. Come on, man. Tracy, good to see you, man. Mm. Love this guy. I'm telling you guys, I'm, I'm broken. I, I bro like, they give me a hard time. COVID protocols are the worst for people who are extrovert and love physical touch. Can I get an amen up in here? <laughs> All right. Verse nine, here we go. So I went to the governors of Trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent, now here it is. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me, all right? Cavalry with me. So you see some people dynamics there. Verse 10, when Sambalot the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. See another people group there, don't you? Um, at verse 11, I went to Jerusalem after staying there. So now he's journeying all the way there, which by the way was a two month journey. It was about 700 miles. So it wasn't like he went to the, you know, um, Ocala from Gainesville. He, it was a two month journey. It says, I, verse 12, I set out during the night with a few men. Uh oh, there's a few men. There's more people. See, rebuilding walls and executing the burden is going to require a few good men. It's going to require a sambalot. It's going to require a ca cavalry. It's going to require. Um, some unique dynamics. I not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. Verse 13. 
By night, I went through the valley gate towards the jackal well and the dung gate. How would you like to live by the dung gate, right? So uh, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. When I moved on towards the fountain gate in the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mouth to get through. So I went up by the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials, here's another group of people here. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing because I... Because as yet, I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Now listen, are, you're seeing a trail of people here that Nehemiah has to engage, communicate, vision cast, lead, resist, all right? I want you tracking with me where we're going this message about people. Verse 17, then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. You see it. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let's rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in this disgrace. Verse 18, I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me and what the king had said to me to do. They replied, boom, he has built a guiding coalition. And in this moment, they in unison, you're talking about a whole people group he's pulled together in Jerusalem, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. Verse 19, we've got some bad, we got some... Villains in the story, right? But when Sambalot the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed. What is this you are doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? Verse 20, I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claims or historic right to it. Lord, help this message to awaken us and stir us to mobilize and care for the people that you love so much. If you agree with that, you say amen. All right, I've got three points I wanna make about people leadership, the leadership challenge of people. And the first one is this. You can expect opposition. You can expect opposition. Hopefully God is birthing in you a vision. He's birthing in you a mission. He's given you a rebuilding project, whether it's in your microchurch, whether it's your marriage, whether it's a personal rebuilding, the walls of your self-control are down. You've got an addiction. You've got a marriage issue. You've got a family issue. You've got a business issue. You've got a ministry microchurch issue. You've got issues, right? And as you're saying, I'm gonna do something about this with God's help, I just wanna go ahead and put it out there. This story communicates what every leadership challenge goes through, which is you can expect opposition. You can expect Sambalots. You can expect Tobias and Geshems. If you look at Jerusalem, the three territories these were kings over were the three surrounding territories. He's actually rebuilding the walls to protect Jerusalem from them. You can expect opposition. If you look back even 400 BC, so somewhere around this time, there's letters that are written by a guy named Sambalot that they found that actually have reference to the walls. If you look at the name Tobiah, in it is the name Yahweh. So Yah, which is kind of, they could have been believers of some sort. And the hardest thing about sometimes opposition is it's not from out there. Sometimes opposition is from the person right next to you. Sometimes the opposition is from family. Sometimes the opposition is from friends. There's no, listen, I'll take a punch, especially if you say it to me and say, hey, Robbie, I'm going to punch you in the stomach right now. So if you give me the heads up on that, I'm like, all right, here comes opposition. I'm going to flex. It's still going to hurt. But then if I'm like, hey, and you're like, wham, and I'm like, ah, you know, that, <laughs> I just reenacted that whole scene in my head. And uh, like, that's a whole different, the air's coming out of me, right? It takes a different win. The hardest thing is when you're showing up, you've got letters from the king, you've got a mission from God, you've got the cavalry with you, you've got protecting soldiers, and you show up in Jerusalem wanting to do something that's good, it's right, it's protecting people, and boom, right in your face. There will be spiritual opposition and there will be human opposition to bringing heaven to earth. Does everybody know that? There will be spiritual opposition and there will be human opposition to the mission that God has given you to do. Not everyone will be excited and on board with the mission God has given you. 
Those of you that are, have been called to the mission field, we have people overseas right now as a part of Greenhouse in very um, persecuted areas sharing the gospel. When they first came and said, hey, I wanna go be, rebuild the walls. I'm heading somewhere. No, a lot of the family was like, what? Or maybe you've got, um, you cast the vision to your family about the walls you're gonna be rebuilding as a family. They're like, what? I'll never forget when I got on to Dave Ramsey about um, like debt reduction and living simply to be able to get your debt down and live like no one else now can live on us later. I I remember I did the whole board. You guys, you know, when those vision boards, right? And you're like, here's our debt. As we pay off debt, let's all put a dream up here and we're gonna live real simply to be able to do the things down here. And I, does everybody know what I'm talking about? Like that whole vision? I remember I was so excited about it. I listened to all the, I went to the classes. I've listened to the podcast. I'm all excited. I cast it to my family. They're like, we're gonna eat what? We're not gonna eat, we're not gonna eat. I mean, I, I'll never, I was like, aren't you guys excited? And they're like, no, you're asking us to sacrifice. I was like, but look what we're gonna have later. And they're like, no, I won't now. And I'm like, ugh, you guys are stupid. Can I trade them out, God? You know, and <laughs> expect opposition. Especially when you're doing something radical. Don't expect everyone to celebrate in. Our potential is one thing and what we do with it is another. There's one key word I want to add to your leadership if you're going to be a great leader because opposition is coming. Every one of your leaders, by the way, everyone's leading something. Leadership is influence. If you're like, oh, this is a message. Can we do this at a conference or something? No, no, no. Every human being is leading something. They're leading themselves. They're leading their kids, their marriage, their family, their business, their microchurch, disciples are doing, community. Out. I mean, everyone's leading something, right? It's this word grit. Every leader needs Grit. Expect opposition, but you need this something. Even the word creates like a, and there's like a this definition where the word actually creates some type of imagery with it where you're like, ah. it's this ability to endure, to persevere, to have some stamina, to have some strength. Um, I, I'll never forget, I was reading this social media thread from a church planter doing a Q&A and someone asked him a question that the church planter was kind of rude to the person asking the question. And someone's like, hey, you should be nicer to that guy. And so the church planter responded, it's like, listen, if they can't handle someone being mean to them on social media, they have no business planting a church. <laughs> they have no business planting a church because the grit and the perseverance you need to plant a new work, to start a new work, requires grit. You've got leadership and mission and vision, but just so you know, opposition's coming. Do you have the grit? Do you have that? You guys ever seen this movie, Rudy? Has anybody ever seen Rudy? Wave at me, you've seen Rudy, right? I love inspiring sports movies in general. All my illustrations are like sports and military stuff, right? But uh, there's one scene in this movie that marked me. Now, if you, the story of Rudy is, big Notre Dame Irish fan, um, wanted to play for them his whole life, traveled there, walked on, practice team, practice team, getting beat up all the time. And there's a play at the end of the movie where um, the quarterback is an all-American quarterback, very gifted and talented. He drops back and he goes for a pass and Rudy comes up and tackles him really hard. And the quarterback, an all-American five-star quarterback is like, come on, man, We're just, it's just practice. Why you gotta play like that? Now I'm paraphrasing. And he kind of yells at Rudy, like, ah. And the coach stops and he moves. And he's like, if you had a tenth of the grit of this man, you'd be world famous. But you got no heart. And I, I, when I saw that, I was like, God, like, because all of us in this room, everyone joining online right now, you are extremely gifted and talented. And the fear I have for myself and all of us is we're not reaching our leadership lid. We're, we're just like, kind of like, we're part of the practice, we're on the team, we're doing our thing. And it is a burden of mine that Robbie, his family, and this church reaches its potential. And we don't have all American ability and capacity and intellect and leadership, but we practice like a Rudy. I'm talking about with, he had grit, but he had no like, skills. Does that mean, <laughs> you guys track on me on that? That's a burden of ours. You need this grit. Lord, give us, and even let's just pray that right now. Lord, we ask you for grit, for perseverance, for strength, for the mission of raising kids, for the mission of our marriages, for the mission of this injustice we're fighting, for the mission that you've put on us. We ask for that grit to be a part of our heart and our mind and our constitution. Expect opposition, you're gonna have Sambalots, Tobias, and Geshems. The next point is this, 
embrace the king's army. I, I, can't, I can't say this enough. Like in verse nine, it says, the king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. If you are going to do what God has calling you to do, you are not designed or capable of doing it alone. And that is why God is going to give you officers and cavalry to do it with you. Is everybody tracking with me on that? So sometimes, like, it's a burden, and we just start running towards Jerusalem. Ah, walls are down. I'm going to do something about it. And then right here, God's like, no, 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 no. Listen, you got a two-month journey. You're going to face some opposition over there. Do not go and do what I'm asking you to do with this burden and clarity without the people around you to support you to get it done. See, Nehemiah is an incredible leader. Nehemiah wasn't running along. He had a cavalry and officers with him to support around him. Matthew chapter 26 says, you strike the shepherd and the sheep scatter. The, one of the more dangerous things is not leaders not doing anything, it's getting there unprepared and this, not the support around them, and they end up floundering and causing more pain. Is everybody tracking with me here? So if you're expecting opposition, embrace the king's support for the mission and burden he has put on your life specifically in two areas. This is where the people inventory is important. If you've got a burden on your life and you wanna do something about it, you need support in two areas. And the first one is you need prayer support. Leadership is not a natural issue, it's a spiritual issue. And if it is spiritual, I, listen, God is integrated in all of life. It's not like, it, okay, if it's a church thing, it's spiritual. No, your business is spiritual. Your family is spiritual. And you need prayer support around you. It's reason leadership is a community thing. It's not an isolated, it's not a Lone Ranger event. You, you need a team around you. First team is prayer, a prayer team. Um, and I, I, the best analogy I've, I've found for me and my heart and narrative is the vision of like, a, like prayer support is like sniper fire. And you never want to move beyond your covering in prayer. You never want to move beyond your covering in prayer. You get outside of your prayer support, you get in a very vulnerable place. Uh, one of the books I read called Team of Teams is talking about military strategy. And when they're in Iraq, there was a city they were taking, the city was, let's just say, this big, and they were trying to um, seize the city, building by building, moving into the center of the city. Um, so what they did was, is they would take snipers, snipers would climb and set up at the top of a building, they would have a range that they could protect covering for the ground troops. And then building by building, the ground troops would go into a building, secure the building, next building, secure the building. All the while, sniper fire is covering them from like their blind side. Once they got too far, out, almost out of the sniper's fire, the snipers would radio down, hey, Paul's right there, rest camp, we're gonna reset our location. They would come down off the building, go to the ahead of them, rise up, and as long as they were under the sniper fire, their backside was covered. Some of us are out in front of our sniper fire in the mission God has called us to do. Would you invite some people on the journey with you to pray for you? You need prayer support, that's your cavalry, and also you need mentorship, mentorship. There is people in this church or in your community, in your micro church, that have went through the journey and rebuilt the things you're trying to rebuild, rebuild. I think of um, maybe someone in this room or online right now has uh, just went through a divorce. They're a single mom now with kids. If you're trying to rebuild and restructure your family right now, how are you, how are you gonna do that? If, if I, my advice to you is find someone about five years beyond you and ask them what they did and help them understand. Maybe you're starting a nonprofit, find a mentor. Maybe you're moving into a new business adventure, find a mentor. You need prayer support for the king's burden that's on your life, and you need mentorship. It's why at Greenhouse, when you're launching a microchurch, you do like a nine-week training. We train you on the mechanics of making a disciple and run a microchurch, and then for the whole time you're leading a microchurch, you get coached at least monthly by a microchurch coach. 
So there's two things. You have a mission as a leader, and then you have, ment- you have prayer support as a leader, and you have mentorship. You should never go launch a justice initiative or a microchurch community or discipleship community or some big initiative, a burden on your heart, without prayer support and mentorship for the journey. Someone say, amen. <laughs> Amen. All right, expect opposition, embrace the king's army. And the last point is my favorite point, which is this, mobilizing the team. Mobilizing the team. So Nehemiah has journeyed with the cavalry, with officers. At this point, um, he's dealt with the opposition that's happening, and now he starts mobilizing the team. Guys, watch watch what this brilliant leader does. He... he, uh, um, He comes and he's there for three days, and for three days, he does nothing. No one even knows why he's there. Maybe they had a hint he was coming because Sambalot was there already. They had this, like, um, they had awareness he was there for three days, he did nothing. And then he did a very strategic moment. He um, took a few men, and in the middle of the night, he went and looked at the walls and the gates with those few men. We just read it. So can you imagine, let's just say Robbie is living in Jerusalem, the walls and gates are down, which means in history, if your walls and gates are down, your city is very vulnerable to attack, right? It's like you're in a dangerous place. You go to bed at night, there's nothing to protect you. So imagine he's walking um, with these guys. He's like, hey, well, tell me about your city. What is this? And they're like, oh yeah, that's the dung gate. Okay, oh, okay, cool, What's the, this is the fountain gate, cool. Like, and then he's probably looking at it, he's like, hey, uh, uh, Steve, um, Where's your, uh, where's your family live? He's like, oh yeah, they live over there by the fountain gate. He's like, okay, cool. Um, are they, you got kids? He's like, yeah, I got three kids. He's like, oh, who, what, what's protecting them? And then it's three in the morning. It's dark outside. They're, they're looking at the walls and gates and the, the city they've been living in, it's vulnerable. And I can see these, these men just like, wait a second, like, this, is, this is not okay. They see the destruction, the insecurity of it, And then they feel it when they think about their families that are vulnerable over the night. They see it and feel it. And then all of a sudden, guess what they're saying? Let's rebuild. Then he goes, after he moves these men, he goes to the leaders. He goes to the the Jews, the priests, the officers. You see him move in progression of like, hey, I've got this this coalition of men. I'm going to pull in these leaders and get them to see it and feel it. And then they say in unison, let's rebuild together. It's the model of Jesus. Jesus took the disciples to the gates of hell. He took them to spaces. He let them feel it. He let them see it. And he said, listen, that gate, that's not going to prevail on my church. The disciples like, yes. He takes them to humans that are suffering. He has compassion on them. And he looks at his disciples. He said, see them? He's like, I have compassion on them. But we need laborers to help them. Pray the Lord of the harvest will send laborers. Yes, Jesus was amazing at helping his disciples see the problem, feel the problem before they'd ever do anything about the problem. Yeah, come on, man. I love verbal and affirmation. So even if I'm saying anything bad, just clap and I'll still feel like I'm doing great. It's one thing to succeed in doing stuff well. It's a whole nother. I think the highest level of leadership is to succeed at getting things done through people. Dio Moody said, I would rather put a thousand men to work than do the work of a thousand men. Teamwork, coaching. You guys ever heard of Greg Popovich? He's the coach of the San Antonio Spurs. Any NBA fans? All right. So I read a long article on Greg Popovich. Been coaching for like, I don't know how many ever years, lots of national cha- um, championships in the NBA, world championships in the NBA. Well, an article about his coaching. His players create some of the most, they, they, he gets the best out of his players for one. Secondly, they create the most deep relationships they've ever had on a team. So he was outlining some of his leadership principles as a basketball coach, what he does. And you know this, he strategizes his whole team around eating together. So he doesn't just, it is very strategic. It's not like, hey, we're going to eat together and throw some food. He's very strategic. Um, For any restaurant they're going to eat at as a team on the road or there in San Antonio, he would go early and he would set up the tables and place teammates in certain places. One of his techniques is, he goes, I want tables of six, not tables of four and not tables of eight. 
And when you hear his rationale behind it, it makes sense. He says, if there's tables of four, there's a lack of diversity in the conversation, you know, and someone can dominate the conversation. Tables of eight, you're always gonna have two people in the end that are boxed out of the conversation. Have you ever been one of those two people and then you're stuck with the lame conversation so you go to the bathroom like four times with a bladder problem because <laughs> you're so bored? Anybody? You know what I'm talking about? So there's nothing worse about being at a party or at a dinner and you're isolated at a weird spot. So he would strategically, even there be games where there, I think it was game four of an NBA finals. They're losing, getting blown out in the third quarter. You know what he does? He looks at his assistant coach and he says, hey, um, call the Capitol Grill. Tell them we'll be there in two hours. He already knew what was gonna happen and he knew what his team would need to be able to go in and win that NBA championship. I was like, oh God, would you let the leaders in his church be as strategic and smart about relationship and maximizing teams? You look at teams like, I think I got a picture of Golden State Warriors and Cleveland Cavaliers when they played in 2017, the NBA championship. This is not the picture of those teams because KD was not on this team at this time actually. Um, that's Kevin Durant, upper left-hand corner, if you didn't know. But um, at that time, Golden State didn't have the star power. They had Curry, they had Clay Thompson, they had Draymond Green, which are all great basketball players, but it wasn't the star power. But they come into Cleveland, which had LeBron James, and you would think LeBron James, but LeBron James didn't have the team chemistry or the team, Golden State Warriors wiped the floor with them. It was another message that like, the, uh, the, the leader's responsibility is mobilizing a team, not just having a great leader. I, when, I'd say a little side note about this whole narrative with leadership. I am deeply impressed in this narrative in Nehemiah that the officials, the Jews, the priests that were in Jerusalem invited someone from the king's palace that wasn't living in their destruction and allowed Nehemiah to speak into their problems. That's, that's hard to do, isn't it? Someone coming from the palace and the cupbearer, all of this like excess in life, they show up and the leaders in that community do something that takes a lot of humility. They say, go ahead and show us. And he's showing them things they've already seen. In that moment, I'm thinking if I'm the person and someone's walking up and saying, hey, your gates are down, your walls are down. I'm like, duh, you know, <laughs> we live in it. Now you're gonna come in here with all your pomp and circumstance and letters from the king and you're gonna do your thing. I was so deeply impressed. And as leaders, this is a principle for us. If you're a microchurch leader online, you're in this room right now, I would invite someone to come into your Jerusalem and identify where your gates and your walls are down. Would you invite them into your discipleship group and say, how am I doing with this? Is it, you think I'm actually making disciples? You think what's happening? Invite them in. Let's just say you're praying with someone. Invite them along to observe and let you know where the gates are down. Because fresh eyes see gates differently than those of us who are living in it. We've got some church planters that are in residency here with Greenhouse. They're gonna probably go plant, they're gonna go plant somewhere in our region. And so they've been on staff for like a month now. And at their first Sunday here, I sat down with them on Monday and I basically said, show me where the gates are down. And they're like, what? And I was like, I don't want you to tell us where our place is great. Show us where the gates are down. And they're like, are you sure? And I was like, yeah. And guess what? I was like, okay, slow down. I can't write that fast. <laughs> but as a leader, it's important to invite people into your Jerusalem where you're protective and let that insecurity like press away and say, I, I know we're strong here, but help us identify weaknesses. So what I want you to do with this message, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take a people inventory. I'm talking about from a leadership level, all right? People are your greatest resource. Take a people inventory in your micro church, in your ministry, in your business, in your family. And I want you to mobilize your army in three key areas. I think I have this up here. Prayer support. That is just support, prayer support. Build a prayer team around you. Number two is this, mentorship. Who's coaching you through this journey? Nehemiah had that. He had support for the journey. Who's coaching you in this journey? Who's helping you navigate through this season? Have someone above you that's been there, that's treasured this, that help you. And number three is, Finding the few good men and the leaders and mobilizing to start rebuilding. 
I, I can't say this enough. Leadership is the single greatest factor in any team's performance, in the individual's performance. Leadership is going to help people achieve their maximum capacity. Let's, and this is the purpose of this whole series in Nehemiah, is raising the leadership quotient of your life, of this church, of your microchurch, of your business, of your family. I got one final story and then we'll close it up. Um, have you noticed I love sports analogies and military strategies, books? I love, they just, they work with me. And um, there's one book called Extreme Ownership, and it's uh, written by some former Navy, Navy SEALs. Some of you guys have seen documentaries on Netflix and different places about Navy SEALs and kind of what they do, but they've got this um, one week that's kind of like the ultimate testing, and it's called Hell Week. And so Hell Week is about, it's a week, and it's extreme exhaustion mentally, physically, emotionally, everything. You don't sleep. You're extending yourself to great measures, right? And they have this little bell that's right here. And if you ever get to a place like you're just too much, they, they say, hey, we have a truck over here. It has uh, food in it. It has water in it. We got a nice bed for you. And listen, anytime you want to ring that bell, we'll take you right there. And slowly, day two, day three, people start tapping out and ringing the bell. One particular exercise that they, they do is... Um, they divide, let's just say there was 42 men in this particular story, and they divided them up in six teams. And they picked a leader from each team, so there's six teams of seven. And each of them had to carry a boat, and I think I got a picture of this raft up here. So they would pull the leaders of each team together and say, hey, here's the mission. You have to go translate this mission to your team, and then you have to go execute it with them. This is the cool part of the story. If you're first you get to sit out some exercises in between that race and the next race while all other five teams have to keep doing exercises. You get to rest. And here was what they had to do. They had to pick up their raft, carry it across the sand dunes, paddle out over the surf about a half mile, go down. The, then they get out of the raft. They have to swim with the raft a half mile down the beach line, get back in the raft, paddle into shore, pick up the raft, run it over sand dunes, and the team that was first got the rest. The other five teams had to do exercises. One team, raft two, was first every single time. Race one, raft two. Race, race two, raft two. And they had big numbers on the side. Race three, raft two. The same team was dead last place. It was raft six. La they were just struggling the whole time. Always last, all three times. They're exhausted, they're fatigued. One of the instructors walks up and says, hey, I want us to do an experiment. This is a true story. I want us to do an experiment. I want us to change the leader of RAF 2 and RAF 6. Keep the 16 members the same, change the RAF. And they're like, that's not fair. You're punishing the one guy for winning, putting him on the last place team. That's not fair. And he's like, I just want to try an experiment right now. So they're, all right, they called him in. He's like, hey, you're not a leader of RAF 6. You're not a leader of RAF 2. We're switching you guys. <laughs> the guy that was the leader of RAF 6, which was horrible, he's like, thank God. You know, <laughs> the RAF 2 guy's mad. They say, all right, ready, set, go. Same race. They carry it. They get about halfway into the water, and they looked. Instead of being last place now, RAF 6 is even in RAF 2. RAF 2. They make the turn, go down the beach line. They're coming up, and they look with the binoculars, RAF 6 is now winning and won the race. All they did in that moment, they didn't change the team members, they just changed the leader. I think the challenge for us sometimes is to recognize what is my leadership doing to someone and how can I shift that with my team? But the greatest question is, who's the captain of your boat? Who's the captain of your boat? Who's leading your life right now? Because it... It changes everything if you get that question right. It changes everything. And some of us, just, just be honest, God's kind of like on the team with us, but he's not the captain. And I, my final appeal is this. The, the greatest leadership question you need to ask yourself is, who is the leader of my life? Who's the captain of my boat? And it changes everything. It, it gives you greater purpose in your life, greater understanding of why you're created, what you're created for, and it, it secures you for all of eternity. And some of you are watching online and you're in this room right now, and you've yet to make a real decision about who Jesus Christ is about what he's done for you, what he's done for humanity. See, the, the truth about humanity is one man's sin mil, uh, uh, thousands of years ago 
brought sin into the world and to all of humanity. And because of our sin, we are in rebellion toward God. We cannot have a right relationship with God. And even in all of our effort of trying, we're like, ah, I got to get to God. I got to get to God. Listen, all other religions are all about self-help and your effort and your effort and your climbing and your paddling. Listen, the issue is not paddling harder for you. The, the issue for you and I is who's the captain of your boat. That changes everything. Today, I want to invite you, whether you're in this room right now, or you're online right now, to make Jesus the captain of your life. He's created this incredible invitation that you can have a right relationship with God because of what he did on the cross, not because of what you're doing in all your paddling. And I want to challenge you as a leader in your life right now, I want to challenge you to make that decision today, to make Jesus the captain, the ruler, the king of your life. Close your eyes all over the room if you wouldn't mind, just so we can feel and hear God, what he's saying to us. Online, stay with me for just a moment. And maybe you're in this space right now where you have been the leader of your life and you need to change that fast and give it to God. You've been the captain and it's struggling and you need to make him the captain. I want you to pray a prayer just like this, whether you're online with me or you're in this room. If you reach out to him, he's gonna respond. Say something like this, say, Jesus, I am sorry for rejecting you. I repent of doing things my own way. I am sorry for being the God of my life. I want you to be the God of my life. Jesus Christ, and this is important right now, would you just confess and say, you are Lord. I make you Lord over my life, Lord over my ship, Lord over my boat. Like you're the captain, you're the king right now. Would you lead me? Say that to him right there. And maybe in your own words, just like, God, you've got to take everything today. I'm going to leave you for just a moment. Sit in that for just a moment. Say, God, you can have my, my relationships. You can have my, my stuff. You can have my talents. You can have my job. You can have my career. You can have Everything. Everything direct this life. Be the captain right now.